Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those joining us online. Grateful to be together, for sure, for sure. Today's message is from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Uh, I'm sorry, 5 through 6. Uh, those are the verses we'll be looking at. The title of the message is that God directs us as we trust, yield to, and acknowledge Him. There's four different things in that title. There's four different things in these two verses, and hopefully we'll see them clearly, and they, they will change us in a very profound way. God directs us as we trust, yield to, and acknowledge Him. This is the ninth part in the Life Principles that Orchestrate, Animate, and Perpetuate Life God's Way series. We want to live life God's way, and we need God for that to happen. How many of us have ever bought something that needs assembly? Not some assembly required, but assembly required. Uh, something like a bed, or a dresser, or a storage unit, or a cabinet. Did you say any bad words before you finally got it assembled? <laughs> right? Anybody, anybody who's, who's done that, have you seen the, the, the picture for the IKEA job interview and it's just a bunch of pieces on the floor? <laughs> That's how you get a job at IKEA. Uh, life uh, is, a, is a similar thing. If you've ever attempted to assemble something, you know how important it is to follow the instructions. So many people just set the instructions aside, figure, I'll get this done. Well, not as fast and not correctly, that's for sure. You know how important it is to follow the instructions. And a big part of following the instructions isn't, isn't just the how-tos, but the when-tos. They're numbered sequentially, in order. And uh, that's an important part of the assembly process. Some things can only be done after the thing before the next thing gets done. Let me say that again. Some things can only be done after the thing before the next thing gets done. You've got to have something assembled before you can go on and assemble what attaches to it. And it's not just beds or dressers or storage units or cabinets that require assembly. So does life, right? It really, really does. And, and some of us feel like a bunch of broken pieces just laying all over the floor. And it's not just some assembly required, but some severe assembly that's requ required. It was just yesterday, and I, I, as I read it, I thought, oh, that, this, I love it when I'm preparing for a message and God puts little nuggets in the way. I, I just saw this for the first time yesterday from a guy who's a hero of mine, a guy named Andy Andrews. I've mentioned him before. When faced with a decision, many people say they are waiting for God. But I understand, in most cases, God is waiting for me. There's a lot of truth in that. Let me say it again. When faced with a decision, many people say they are waiting for God. But I understand, in most cases, God is waiting for me. If nothing else, I hope what we'll all see this morning from this message is that our walk with God is not meant to be static, motionless. Uh, certainly not immovable. He's immovable, but he moves us. And there's there's just so much to this. Uh, so often, and the older I get, the fewer things I remember. The older I get, the fewer things that really continue to you know to be at the forefront. And when it comes to this, and acknowledging that you know uh, it, it's not so much that I'm waiting on God, but that God is is waiting on me. We have to acknowledge that part of walking with God involves movement. And it's in the moving, in the going, that what he has for us comes to us and then is, is made known not just to us but through us. So it's, it's an absolutely, um, absolutely beautiful thing. And, and acknowledging again, there's this little caveat to contextualize this, and it, not to take this out of context, but to understand that on, unless and until we understand how important it is to, to not allow our sense of waiting for God to get in the way of action for God, there's a difference between faith and presumption. How many times have you heard me say that? 5,742 probably? There's a difference between faith and presumption. They can look alike from the outside, but eventually the results show up. And presumption often leads to chaos. Faith leads to something that's beautiful. But, but again, both of them involve action. Here's the theme. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 is a source 
of great strength, confidence, comfort, and peace. If you don't already know that, I hope that's something that you see in a new way today. And the application for this message is this. Live these two verses as four distinct imperatives we experience concurrently as we walk with God. It's not just this one, this one, this one, and this one. It's this one, this one, this one, and this one. It's concurrent. They, they, they happen together. And as they happen together, the, the future changes for sure. Uh, an ongoing theme, here's the focus, an ongoing theme throughout this life principles that orchestrate, animate, and perpetuate life's God's way. Yes, I've inserted the word animate for the rest of the series. It seems like it should have been there from the beginning. It's that Proverbs, promises, and principles are three different things. Again, if you've known me for a while, we've probably talked about this. They're three different things by definition. But by experience, they're, they can be very uh, intertwined. Uh, and that's what it says there, isn't it? Uh, often... They seem to intertwine with or run parallel to one another, but they're always three different things. Today's message is some kind of blending of all three. It is literally proverbial, as it is found in the book of Proverbs. It articulates a clear principle and carries a promise. This should be fun. And may this message inspire you to do whatever God says. Because if if you and I embrace this and this becomes a part of of how we roll for the rest of our lives, then then there will be some fun that we wouldn't have had otherwise just in the experiences God brings. But hopefully it'll make it easier and easier and easier for us to just simply say, as the old song says, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, that's one of the phrases in this passage, with my whole heart, I'll agree. God, if I know it's you speaking, I'm just going to say yes. If I don't understand it, if it doesn't make sense to me for now, so be it. But if it's you speaking, and he's always speaking through his word, but by his spirit too, apart from but still related to his word, he'll speak. If it's him, the correct response is always yes. Yes to whatever God says. So uh, for for context, let's read the uh, entirety of the beginning of this where these two verses are nestled in here. <clears throat> and this is Proverbs 3. We'll read verses 1 through 8. And uh, this is <clears throat> the writer of Proverbs is, is, is uh, using wisdom or personifying wisdom. It's as though wisdom itself is speaking to us. And it's, it's, it's wise to be wise. <laughs> And here's what Proverbs 3, 1 through 8 says. We're going to spend our time on 5 through 6. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and find a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Again, to make this point, that these are not all promises here. These are proverbs. These are principles. Especially there, that, that uh, first, those first two verses. And notice that the, the majority of this uh, proverb, in fact, as I glance through it again now, I believe all of them are couplets. They're two verses together, two verses together, two verses together, two verses together. All that are one complete thought. And three, one, Proverbs 3, 1 through 2, wisdom says, My son, my child, do not forget my teaching and keep your commands in my heart, for they will prolong your life many years and will bring you peace and prosperity. <clears throat> not everybody who reads those who loves God at an early age lives to be an old age. So does that make God a liar? No, this isn't a promise. It's a proverb. It's a principle. They're connected. They they are patterns that are n- nor, that that are connected. This if, if this is your lifestyle choice, then normally you're going to live a longer life than those who don't. This is not a promise. It, it's an if then principle. So for whatever that's worth, and it's worth a lot because this could mess up your faith if you claim that as a promise, and somebody doesn't live to be an old age, to an old age. But it's five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And the way I memorized it as a baby Christian was, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or he will make your paths straight. 
And so the first point this morning is this. God's direction, this is like, oh, wow, Dan, I really needed to come here to learn this. But it is. It's bottom line truth that needs to be in place before you can put the next shelf on top, as it were, speaking of assembly. It's We need to be sure that we're sure that we're sure about this. God's direction is something only he can give. Only God can give his direction. Well, you're brilliant, Dan. Way to figure that out. Well, it's not, again, I'm not saying it's so much something to figure out. It's just something to observe. Only God can give you his direction. Underneath that first point, just to reiterate it, there's no one else who can give you the direction you need, not the ultimate direction you need, direction all the way to heaven. And every stop in between on earth. Only God can do that. He will use other people, but, but it's God himself that is the one who can direct your life the way it needs to be lived for sure, uh, for, for the best. So, again, Proverbs 3, 5. We'll look at this verse first. This verse first. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. There's the first one. And it's important to acknowledge in both of these uh, couplets inside each of the verses is the word and. And that's important to acknowledge. It's these two and these two. Yes, two twos make four. They do. And we see these four different phrases in these two verses. And the first verse we're going to look at in and of itself says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. This verse is a life verse for many believers. Uh, th- this just happened this week too. Have you ever? Has anybody ever asked you what's your life verse and do you have a life verse and what's your answer to that life verse? And I, I find myself again as I get older, which is more and more uh, I'm more aware of, is that it, it, I have a few verses that have really l- helped lead my life. It's, I don't have a life verse. Uh, the two verses that God used to bring me to Himself on May 31st, 1982, are life-giving verses to me, but a life verse, but I would say one of my life verses is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 because it, it, it covers all the bases. The first one is the first one on purpose. If this isn't in place and this isn't happening, then our best attempts at 2, 3, and 4 will, will falter the entire way because the very first thing that wisdom says to us concerning this is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Two big things there, right? the Lord himself, and the entirety of your heart. Which, again, is acknowledging this first point. God's direction is only something he can give. And these these two verses are also an example. I I don't think I've said this yet. I want to make sure this is said before all is said and done here. That that, uh, it's also an example, these two verses, of the, at times, you will find this in the scripture. Not always, but at times, you will find this on the script, in the scripture. So put out a bolo on this. Be on the lookout for this as you read the scriptures in the day, days ahead. There are times in scripture when there is a clearly sequential order to the phrases that are stated. This is an example. These are clearly in sequential order. Another one that's clearly in sequential order that I've mentioned once or twice or a thousand times is Luke 9.23, right? If anyone desires to come after me, Jesus says this. So like, give it your best shot. But if you really want to follow me, these three things need to happen in this order. It's in Luke 9.23, and I think it's in Matthew and Mark somewhere also. But Luke 9.23, Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me or to be my disciple, it's rendered different ways in the different passages. If anyone desires to be my disciple, he or she, he must first deny himself, take up his cross, not my cross, his cross, her cross, your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me daily. Do you see the sequential nature of that? Are you going to pick up something that will kill you? If you haven't already denied yourself? I mean, in today's vernacular, right, for Luke 9.23, it would be, depending on what generation you're born, take up your guillotine. Take up your lethal injection. This thing is certain to end your life. 100% of the people who carried a cross died on a cross. 100%. 
So, so the first thing he says is deny yourself, take up your cross. Yes, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna get between you and me and anything that would keep you from me is what God is saying. Take up your cross and now you can follow me. If, if you just go, I'm gonna follow Jesus and you never encounter this radical call to, to total denial of self and complete embrace of a cross, you'll never be able to follow him fully. I'm not saying you're not his, and I'm not saying you're not following him. But he threw it down that day, and that's sequential. This is sequential. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. It is, it is very clearly sequential. And let's, uh, let's uh, again acknowledge the very beginning of that fifth verse. Trust in the Lord with, your ha- with all your heart. How does that, that play out? Isn't it so easy to say, trust in the Lord with all your heart? Isn't it so easy to hear the words, trust in the Lord with all your heart? See, we just did both. But when it comes to actually doing it, it begs the question, how does this play out? What does this look like? What does this actually mean in the push and shove of daily living? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. How does it play out? It plays out in every situation involving every individual every single day of your life. Every situation, the good ones, the bad ones, the ones you welcome, the ones you'd rather reject. Uh, spent some time this past week with a dear friend who is lying motionless with ALS. Can only speak by looking at letters on a iPad that form words. Can you imagine? That They didn't sign up for that. How, do, how does she trust the Lord with all her heart when a respirator is keeping her alive? They have a backup unit because if the power goes out, she, she won't live. ALS is an ugly disease. There'll be no ALS in heaven. There'll be no cancer in heaven. There'll be no diseases in heaven. But for now, here we are. And so it's very easy again for me to just say, how does that play out in every situation involving every individual every single day? I would add now even every single moment of every single day for the rest of your life. That's how it plays out. Because if by God's grace we have placed our trust in him, then anything that gets to us gets comes to us with his permission. That's a tough one, isn't it? God didn't. God never looks and says, oh, how did that happen? He sees everything. He watched it happen. He saw whatever was going on in her body that, that is the ALS begin its assault. He saw that. How do you keep trusting him? Again, you'd, you'd have to ask her, but certainly in principle, it's a decision we make. He's God. He made the universe. He made me. He made every big thing. He made every little thing. He made every everything. And if I can't trust him... Who can I trust? Me? The person I'm married to? Somebody, a dear friend, a dear family member? Not for these things you can't trust, and there's nothing they can do about them. But we can trust him. And it's a decision we make based on who he is because of the grace he gives us. And then the big part of this and the practicalities of it, of it playing out, especially when it comes, or often when it comes, but especially in some very real ways, to the loss of a loved one when death takes a loved one from us. In that situation, we are still able with all of our heart to trust him. And one of the big reasons we can do that is because there's this amazing grave that speaks of amazing grace over there in Jerusalem. Right? It's empty. He was only there for three days. So I can trust him. He's defeated death. He's conquered the grave. So I will trust him. And I can trust him with all my heart. Because if I don't give him all my heart, it's kind of like the Achilles heel thing. Any part of my heart that I keep to myself, if I put up a no trespassing sign, including you, God, in my heart, oh, that ground is going to take over. And you're going to lose your whole heart if you don't trust him with all your heart. And that's why this is so important. Because none of us knows uh, what life is going to throw at us or how life is going to go. So that's how it plays out. Every situation, every single day, involving every single person. How does it not play out? And I think I alluded to this, but how does this not play out? It does not play out by placing our trust 
in anyone or anything else before him. Because if you place your trust in your 401k, how'd that work out in the last couple of years, right? If you place your trust in somebody who winds up betraying you, do you know who will never betray you? God. Never, ever, 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 ever. And if you've ever been betrayed, you know what a punch to the gut that is, what, what a piercing of the heart that is when somebody betrays you. And so the, how this doesn't play out is by you putting your trust in anyone or anything else before God. I'm not saying there aren't people you can trust. And I'm not saying there aren't things you can trust. But again, not for what rings of forever and for what concerns things that only God can deal with. And then the end of that fifth verse, and lean not on your own understanding. So again, this is the, this is this is sequentiality. Is that a word? Let's make it a word. Sequentiality. That's a new word. The sequential nature of this is so clear. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Because if, if you, if you make the commitment to trust the Lord with all your heart and then you get to your own understanding in between your trust in God and your current situation, oh, that could get messy pretty quick. Cause how much information do you have? Not much. What, what's your perspective like? It's skewed. I remember the day, year, months, or years ago, when, and I'm only five, six, when I was out walking the dog, and I remember thinking, what does this look like to her, our little dog Naomi? And I got down on the ground. It's a whole different world down there. And when you're standing up, you can see things you can't see, but when you're down on the ground, I had some smells too that I wasn't aware of till I got down that low. But it's, you, you, perspective changes what you can see and what you can know. Again, for the sake of making a point, the ultimate rhetorical question and ultimate rhetorical question, what can't God see? What doesn't God know? What understanding doesn't God have? So wisdom is telling us, lean not on your own understanding. And it's important to understand that that lean not on your own understanding, as I said, begins with the word and. They go hand in hand, trusting and understanding. Does it say ignore your own understanding? No. Don't ignore it. Factor it in. Acknowledge it. But understand that the understanding you have is far less than the understanding God has. Think of that verse, the other verse in the Old Testament. Where is it? It escapes my mind. My ways are not your ways. Your ways are not my ways. My ways are higher than you. I think it's in Isaiah somewhere maybe. My ways are higher than your ways. I see things you don't see. I know things you don't know. So don't just lean on your own understanding because you've got about this much and God's got unlimited, uh, unlimited amount. So it's again, this is just a call to being reasonable and rational. Don't lean on your own understanding. It's a call to remember that the knowledge you and I have is finite and it's influenced and it's fallible. Let me say that again. The wisdom that you and I have is finite, it's influenced, and it's fallible. And all the influences that you and I have embraced are not necessarily connected to reality. And especially when it comes to God. God has been so misunderstood and so misrepresented. Hasn't he? And, and, if, and if you or I find ourselves imprisoned with a false perspective or, or, or not just a false perspective, but uh, uh, b- believing lies about God. That's what happens again with lies. You believe them, you live them, even when it comes to God. And so our understanding, we need to, we need to heed the trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding because wisdom is inviting us, again, I would say, to a much better life. Because then we'll see things, we'll, we'll be more likely to more ably see things for what they really are, people for who they really are, God for who he, who he really is. So again, the first point, God's direction is something only he can give. Don't look anywhere else but to God for God's direction. The second point is this, God's direction comes to us as we're on the way. Again, I was acknowledging it's not static. It's not, it's not something that doesn't move. It is moving. And, and in fact, uh, this, I, I, the first time I was made aware of this, I, there are often times when I'm watching baseball that I, 
I, I find myself remembering it and thinking and watching. And sure enough, and if you've never done this, do this. Next time you watch a big league game, whenever, whenever somebody comes up at bat, the bat is always moving. Have you ever noticed that? Not much. But any time, you, you're standing, is it 90 feet away from a pitch? How far is it from the, well, it's not very far. And then they throw fast and the balls go, and, uh, and, and the person who's up at bat, watch it the next time, just for an inning, watch every batter who steps up to the plate. Before the ball leaves the pitcher's hand, the bat is moving. It's not static. Because when you've got a split second, if it isn't already moving, you're going to miss it. What a great illustration that is of this. That you, you have, there has to be movement for there to be, a, to, for there to be an appropriate follow through. I'll bet you're frosty, and I don't bet, you know that, but I'll bet you're frosty. You can, if you can find a clip of a baseball, of a, of a batter up at bat, and the bat isn't moving before the ball is hit, I'll buy your frosty. Because they're always moving. Getting over inertia is a thing. And again, especially in that situation, oh, I gotta be careful with this thing, this thing right here. Getting over, getting over that, uh, that inertia, you'll, you'll, you'll just strike out. And that's what this is about. God's direction comes to us as we're on the way, as we're moving, as we're ready for life, as we ask God for the grace we need. Under that second point, uh, the other illustration, the thought that came to my mind also with this is it's really, it really is like riding a bike and that it only works with your moving. When you're moving, that's another. I'll buy you two Frosties if you can find a batter who isn't moving his bat, and I'll buy you two Frosties if you can get a video of yourself just sitting on a bike that's not moving for five seconds. You can get two Frosties if you can sit on a bike that isn't moving and you're not moving, and it stays up. The only way to ride a bike is to ride a bike, and that's what this verse is. In all your ways. That speaks of movement and paths and direction, doesn't it? In all your ways, this the, the newer uh, rendering in the NIV uses the word submit, yield to. Uh, another, some translations have, in all your ways, acknowledge him uh, as the one leading, uh, and he will make your path straight, and he will guide your steps, guide your paths. But again, the, the word and is in that fifth verse. Uh, the final two parts of this passage begin with, in all your ways acknowledge him. Simple, clear, important, and, I'll say it again, sequential. It follows what preceded it. It's before how the verse ends. Clearly saying, in all your ways acknowledge him. And without uh, uh, belaboring what I just said is clear. It's important to highlight this so we don't miss it. This perhaps is the clearest expression of how it is to be a forward expression of ongoing, forward-moving, ever-growing, what should be for us an onward-going, forward-moving, ever-growing walk with God. All your ways, not in all the times you're standing still, I'm not saying there isn't a time to be. Of course there is. And that's the, 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 the wisdom of God's word. Uh, you know, be still and know that I'm God. It's not that you're always moving physically, but your attitude is always is one of, again, always being ready to take a pitch. Always ready. Whatever might come. And knowing that in that, in that attitude, there will be an action that is potentially very, very beautiful. And another way to acknowledge this is the last thing we, Jesus says before he ascends into heaven. He doesn't just say make disciples. He says go make disciples. Go making disciples. Make disciples as you're going, as you're moving. And then uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the hope that we have as we acknowledge him in all our ways, one of the most beautiful um, results and even consequences as it pertains to obedience, because we talked about that recently. God will take full responsibility for all the consequences of our obedience. When we do this, when, when we acknowledge him in all our ways, do you know what happens when we acknowledge him in all our ways? We find ourselves not sinning. Right? It's the byproduct of that. 
Instead of just trying, and I'm not saying, you know, there's sin to resist and besetting sin that Hebrew speaks about and the evil one himself to resist him. But, but there's this sense of when I'm acknowledging God in all my ways, is God ever going to lead you to temptation? What does the Bible say? Does he tempt anybody? No. He doesn't tempt to get you to do the wrong thing. He doesn't. And so if we're acknowledging him in all our ways, sin will not be able to find its way to us, and we will not be finding a way to it because God will never guide us in the way we shouldn't go or to a thing we shouldn't do. He will never do that. So if we will take him at his word, in all of our ways we submit to him, in, in all of our ways we acknowledge him, we will find ourselves walking in a greater freedom, in a greater light than we than than if we just you know give it our best effort. No, if we're acknowledging Him and He's leading our lives, and we have already trusted Him with all of our heart, and we are not leaning on our own understanding, and now we are committed to acknowledge Him in every single thing we do. He will never lead us to do one thing we shouldn't do. He will never do that. Not even one thing will He ever lead us to do that we shouldn't do. He will never lead us the wrong way. Never, not once. He just won't. So as we acknowledge him in all our ways, we're good to go in a way we wouldn't have been otherwise. And then the last one, uh, clearly, beautifully, um, wonderfully. And it says, I don't know what how your translation says it, and he will direct your paths. He will make your path straight. Some translations say he will guide your steps. And it's important to note the and. There are two ands in these two verses that are between the two phrases in each singular verse. I'm not trying to do math here. I'm just acknowledging the clarity of this. That first, that fifth verse has two phrases. That sixth verse has two phrases. And together they, they, they make four phrases that express one complete thought. That that are expressed and experienced concurrently even, even though they're listed sequentially. I hope that makes sense. It, at least it, it helps. It, it should help us to see, again, the wisdom of wisdom. And who's the, who's the giver of wisdom? God. Who's the giver of knowledge? God. The wisdom that God has given us on this side of the fall. He gave this to us after everything fell apart in Genesis chapter 3. Now wisdom shows up and says, hey, this is how you're going to get from here to there in light of the way things are, by doing these four things, or these three things, and then believing him for that fourth thing. And the fourth thing is simply, he will make your paths straight. And in him doing that, again, it's connected to being able to say, you know, God, I don't, I don't, I don't even know which way to turn here. I don't even know which way to turn here. And if there is a turn, he'll make it clear. If it's no, you still keep going this way, he'll make it clear. Whatever it is, if we're tuned in, he'll make it clear. You know what else is another great illustration of this? Some of you younger people will will never uh, experience this on, a, on the way we used to on a daily basis. All the old radios, all the old radios in your car used to have dials, not buttons, right? And... And as you were getting closer and closer to the feed from whatever the radio station is, it became clearer and clearer. And then you did your best guess as when you got to the top of the signal. And if you're in your car, it'll fade as you keep going. But if you're, if you're somewhere and you turn the dial to uh, whatever the station is, it comes in loud. If you keep going, it fades out and you're back into the static. That, again, is a great word picture of this, of tuning in to what God, who God is and what God is saying. That, that it gets clearer and clearer, and then sure enough, soon it is coming directly to you. S don't touch that dial at that point. It's right there. And that's what this is, is about. And what is the static? The static is all the voices and all the other beliefs and teachings and, and things that are calling for your attention and have nothing to do with eternity that will try to get you to waste some time, the most precious thing you have. So these two verses take care of all of that, all of it, simply by, and again, simply by doing what God says, 
going back to the to the instructions. Somebody who knew what they were talking about wrote those instructions to make it as easy as possible for you, the user, on the end of whatever this transaction was. Now you have the materials. Now you have the directions. Hopefully you've assembled the tools you need. Now you can put that thing together. And those instructions were written by somebody who was directly related to the product itself. That's exactly what's going on here. That we understand God is the one who invites us, calls us, you know, is, is, is longing for us to trust him with all of our heart and to not lean on our own, I'll insert this for the sake of making the point of our own limited understanding. Because all any human being has is limited understanding. And then in all your ways, acknowledge him, submit to him, and he will make you pass straight. And the way these blend together, I said earlier, all three at one, that last one is a promise in, in the context of this. He will do that. It may not go the way you think it was going to. It may not go the way you think it should. But he will direct your paths. And then through it all, and that's a big part of this whole message and a part of life itself, through it all, whatever life has, whatever it's had, whatever it currently is giving us, and whatever it provides for us in the future, wherever it takes us, we can know that there is one, only one, we can trust fully, always, implicitly, God himself, because he's God himself. Anyone can do this. Not everyone will, but anyone can. And I was thinking as we conclude here, looking back over my life, I invite you to do this looking back over your life. I can look back over my life and connect the dots between the moments when I was somewhere where I was supposed to be inside of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And wouldn't you know, God directed my paths. From somehow he directed my path first to him to save me. And then after he saved me, a couple years after he saved me, somehow or another, he directed my path to this place called Last Days Ministries. It was, it was just what I needed. Looking back on it now, I, I would say to qualify it, it was more heat than light, but it was good for me. And then from that time at Last Days Ministries, I found my way to this place called YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And from YWAM, I found my way to Amsterdam, where for months I lived in Europe playing the trumpet, doing music and drama street evangelism. How do you get a card-carrying pagan from Menor High School named Dan Page to Amsterdam playing the trumpet, doing music and drama street evangelism, all the way then fast forward to this very moment to be the pastor of a church? How does that happen? Somebody else was directing my steps. I couldn't have made this up. Couldn't have. Some, in some ways, you know, and this is part of the, you can laugh at it, you can live with it. There's some things about all that stuff I wouldn't have chosen. But at the end of the day, nothing but gratitude that there is one above us who guides us down here. And he's with us down here too by his spirit. And so if we will do this, if we will trust him with everything we've got, with all of our heart, if we will refuse to limit our uh, awareness of knowledge to our own understanding. And I didn't say this, but let me say this before we finish. That lean out on your own understanding, that's an invitation to pick the brain of other people, to touch the heart of other brothers and sisters who are further down the road than you are. Learn from them. You're learning from God when you learn from them. But it's God you're learning from. So I'm not saying just your own understanding and you and God, me and God, we got this. Well, there are times maybe where that's going to happen, but as far as life is concerned, it's us and God we got that. I don't know anybody who's a healthy Christian by themselves without other brothers and sisters. I don't know one person who is. Whole other message for a whole other day. Here's the making of real questions. Are you convinced that only the giver of life can best guide us in life? Are you convinced that only the one who gave you your life can guide you in your life. I hope you are. And if you don't know him yet, I hope you'll meet him really soon. Because if you don't know him yet and you're and, and you're trying to and you've been trying to call the shots in your life, I, I go back again to what that powerful scene at the end of the help where whoever she is looks at Miss Hilly and just says, Ain't you tired? Aren't you tired of trying to live life disconnected from the one who made you and loves you? Aren't you tired? 
If you're not yet, come back and see me. I know you're going to get tired. Because to try to live life on your terms, refusing and rejecting the one who made you and knows you and loves you and can bring you this gift of eternal life. How can you keep going without him? So again, the question is, are you convinced that only the giver of life can best guide us in this life? And the second making it real question is, do you see and have you experienced the significance of this? This being that God's direction comes to us as we're on the way. God's direction comes to us as it is, as again, thinking back to what was shared earlier, as, as, it, as it is as we stand in the batter's box waiting for a pitch. You can't take a pitch on first base. You can only take a pitch in the batter's box. And you can only respond to the pitch with a bat. And you, you, you only have a hope of even hitting that ball with a bat if the bat's already moving before the ball is thrown. It's being, you know, ready. And then uh, give it your best shot. <laughs> you might hit a home run. You might get thrown out of first base, but at least you hit the ball. Just, just keep trying. And here's the action step. Memorize this passage, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Memorize it if you haven't yet. And then spend Monday prompt, pr prayerfully pondering that first phrase. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Tuesday, and lean not on your own understanding. Wednesday, in all your ways acknowledge Him. And then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and He will direct your path. Just keep pondering and praying about those phrases. And trust Him to light you up with the awareness of uh, how good it can be if God has his way. And again, I, it should go without saying, but I'll say it just to make sure we, we get it and we're good to go. Um, let God have his way. If, 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 you're not, if your desire isn't for God to have his way in your life, may, may that desire be jettisoned by you today. And may you cry out to God, please have your way in me and through me. Watch what he'll do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we look to you again on the very same day of the week on which Jesus rose from the dead. It was a Sunday. It changed everything then and it continues to change everything now. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. How grateful we are that death has been destroyed and the grave has been denied. And that's forever. We pray for the grace we need that only you can give us for, the, for, for us, give for us to trust you to provide the direction that we long for, to live the life the way you desire and intend for and through us. May Proverbs 3 and 5 not just be a mantra that somebody says, but a commitment that, that we make to do these things for your glory, God. And God, we do lift this wounded and dying world to you. The news continues to be hard and bad, and things are increasing in a way they haven't before. We ask you to help us know and do our part concerning everyone else who is on this earth today with us today. Help us to remember we really are our brother's keepers. We pray that you deliver us from complacency and self-sufficiency and idolatry and the insanity of isolation. Help us to care for our brothers and sisters. Help us to love our neighbors. Help us to do whatever we can to help bring relief and comfort and peace and real love. We pray for this church. Only you know what the days ahead hold for us. Help us be where you'd have us to be, doing what you'd have us to do. And we do ask that for your glory. And then finally, God, we lift those among us here and online for whom this has been a very difficult week. And certainly for some of us it has been a very difficult week. Only you know the heartache and the confusion and the anger and the fatigue with which some of us are living these days. It still lingers and it still hurts and we're still struggling and we need your help. Life comes to us on its terms, but only as you allow. Help us never stop trusting and believing you through it all. And together, God, we do thank you that right here and right now, by your grace, till we get to heaven, there is a place of rest in you. Thank you for loving us the way you do. Thank you, Jesus, for being our best friend. 
what a friend we have in you. Thank you again for this time together. We'll never pass this way again. We pray that you'll take what's taking place here and bring it to the days ahead in a way that makes a difference for good in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's benediction is simply this. Go now to keep on growing in the grace and the knowledge and the peace and the power of God. Amen.